to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ beware brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort or encourage one another while it is called today, lest we be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 3 verses 12 and 13 encourages fellow Christians with a Hebrew background to not give up on Christ and go back to the old way of life. And friend, as we think today about the book of Hebrews, that encouragement is so powerful for every child of God who has come out of a past life in sin, and all of us have, Romans 3 verse 23, not to go back. Don't give up on Christ. Keep pressing forward. Go toward the prize is the powerful message of the book of Hebrews. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study together in the Word of God. We want to encourage you to take Take just a moment to find your Bible and get it handy as we're going to study together in the book of Hebrews from the Word of God. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church in your area, the Church of Christ, would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly on Sunday or Wednesday. They'd be more than happy to have you as their guest. Uh, if you've got a, a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the church or God's plan of salvation or whatever it may be. Friend, there are people there who would love to sit down and study the Word of God with you and you'll find people who love God and who are concerned about souls. Friend, we also here at the Gospel of Christ want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. You will find a host of Bible study materials, all of our video lessons, audio lessons, we've got transcripts, study questions, written material, just a vast library of good Bible study material that would help you in your journey to know God and His will better. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on Hebrews or any of our lessons, you can download those free of charge from our website or you can write to us or call us, email us, and we'd be glad to get that to you. And we want to encourage you in the day and age of smartphones to download our app for the Gospel of Christ app. It is available on Android and from the Apple Store as well. And that's a great way to study God's Word uh, from our phones as well. Again, we're glad that you've joined us. Hope you've got your Bible handy. And let's begin thinking about the book of Hebrews together. What is Hebrews all about? Well, you've got to understand a little bit of the background of what's going on to see the bigger picture of the book of Hebrews. Imagine that you are a Christian in the first century. And former to that, in your prior life, you were a faithful Jew. And you were steeped in Judaism and its tradition, but you saw the light. You realized that all of that in the Old Testament was pointing you toward Christ. You left that behind. You became a Christian. And with all its blessings and benefits, no doubt it was the best decision of your life, but there are now some challenges that are coming up. Your family, who did not become Christians, doesn't want anything to do with you now because you have abandoned Judaism and its tradition. Uh, your business, which was dependent upon part of the Hebrew nation, is now failing. Your friends, your social life is no more because people now, because you left Judaism, look at you as a traitor and a blasphemer and they have basically excommunicated you. Some of these Christians likely are feeling that way. And so they're thinking in their own mind, wouldn't it just be easier to go back, to go back to Judaism, to go back to the old Hebrew way and uh, to leave all this behind? 
Some of them no doubt must be contemplating that. For the writer is going to encourage them on multiple occasions not to do that. And the main point of the book of Hebrews is to show the superiority of Christ. Why would you leave Christ? There is nothing better, nothing greater, and nothing superior to Christ and the Christian way. That's the major message, to convince Christians who have a Hebrew background, don't give up on Christ. He's the superior one. Central theme, of course, of the book is the supremacy of Christ and Christianity over the Old Covenant, Old Covenant images, and Old Covenant people. And so Christ is greater than, is kind of the idea that you'll hear. Now, that application applies so directly and practically to the Christian life today. We think about the theme of, of Hebrews, the superiority of Christ. Don't go back. And, you know, that's such a powerful lesson for every, every child of God. What did you come out of? Maybe you came out of sin. All of us who are of an accountable age did. Maybe you left the world. Denominationalism, error, a life that was steeped in, in uh, worldliness. Whatever we've left behind to become a Christian, friend, don't ever forget, you're in the best life. What you have now is so much greater and superior to the old life that we have. At times we say to ourselves, I'm going to throw in the town, give up, and go back to my... No, don't go back. What you've done is the greatest thing ever in becoming a Christian, and Christ and Christianity are far superior to anything we might have had. Now, there are some keys that help us to understand uh, the book of Hebrews. We want to mention just a few of those to you. Some of the keys in this book are the key word. The words um, better, uh, excellent, much more, those will occur somewhere around 34 times in the book of Hebrews. And so the idea is you've got the better, the best, the more excellent. The way you're in and the path you're living now is the best life, the better way. There isn't anything better than the Christian life. Key verse, Hebrews 3, verse 12 and 13, the Hebrew writer says, Beware, take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing. There's that picture of them going back in departing from the living God. Instead of doing that, encourage one another, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest we be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And so key idea is don't go back. Don't give up. Encourage one another every day. Now, one of the key phrases that you'll find throughout uh, the book of Hebrews, and especially like in chapter 11, is that phrase, by faith. And it means by faithfulness, by perseverance. Again, the idea of by not giving up, by continuing to trust in God, we can overcome and have the good life as God wants us to. Now, another key to understanding the book of Hebrews, and, and this is why sometimes Hebrews might be a little hard for some, is we've got to understand there are over 100 usages or references to the Old Testament in the book of Hebrews, especially uh, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. It'll be, uh, the book of Hebrews is replete with image, imagery and references to that. And so maybe one of the re main reasons we don't understand Hebrews and some of the New Testament is maybe we really don't understand the Old Testament and its images as well. And so we need a good working knowledge of these images as well to understand that. Now, as we think about the message of Hebrews, we want to outline this in our introductory lesson. We want to outline this in a way that it flows so smooth and it naturally does and that it makes it easy for us to understand. Basically, you can break the book of Hebrews into three major sections. Hebrews chapter 1 through 7, you've got the superiority of Christ. That is, and we just briefly mentioned this, Christ greater than angels, greater than Joshua, greater than Moses, greater than Aaron, greater than the Levitical priesthood. Christ is greater than all these things you Hebrews have put stock in. And then chapters 8 through 10, you have the superiority of Christ's covenant. Christ is greater than and Christ's covenant 
is greater than. Chapters 8 through 10 will show the superiority of the covenant, the superiority of the sacrifices, and on all those things that for so long these Hebrews have put their faith in. Then chapters 11 through 13, the superiority of Christian living. So chapters 1 through 7, superiority of Christ. Chapters 8 through 10, superiority of Christ's covenant. And chapters 11 through 13, the superiority of Christian living by faith. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 12, the, the greatness of continuing to trust Christ. And chapter 13, the final exhortations he'll make to Christians along the way. And so just for a few minutes, let's introduce these key ideas in each chapter and really help set the stage for our study of the book of Hebrews. Chapter 1 will open with Christ is greater than angels. And it begins with these words. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. Go on to say, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds. He's now at the right hand of God. He's become so much better than the angels. Now why does the writer need to show that Christ is greater than angels. There is some uh, background in history that tells us that the Hebrews no doubt put angels up on a very high place. That is, they realized their place in God's working and they kind of looked up to that idea of the angel in some way. But then there's another reason and I think this is why the Hebrew writer mentions this. In Galatians 3.19 and in Acts 7 verse 53 it is told to us that in delivering the Old Covenant, in delivering the Ten Commandments, it was done through the hands of angels by, to the mediator, and thus God gave them the Old Ten Commandment Covenant through the hands of angels to Moses. They played an integral part in that. And so angels are looked up to because when that old law was given, they played a pretty big function in the delivery of that. Well, friend, when God gave man His new covenant, who did He use to give that? Not angels. God sent His own Son to deliver, hand deliver, that law to the people. And so there may be some ideas that angels were looked up to a lot by the Hebrew people, and no doubt there's some history that shows that. But a greater lesson is this. The Old Covenant, delivered by the hand of angels, was a great law, but when God brought us the New Covenant that you're a part of today, He's saying, God hand-delivered that by His own Son. Even in the delivery of God's new law, it's greater because of the One who delivered it. Christ is so much greater, so much more uh, excellent than angels. He has a better name than they. The name Son, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 4 through 6 will tell us. Then we move into Hebrews chapter 2 and we learn about the greater salvation. Paul or the Hebrew writer is going to tell us, let's not neglect that great salvation for the word spoken through angels, the Old Testament law, the word spoken through angels proved steadfast. Every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. Listen to these words. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which no doubt, as we've said, was delivered by God's own Son. And so you've got this idea continued. Yes, that was a good law. God delivered it by angels. When people didn't follow that law, there were serious consequences to that. But think about this question. If when it was delivered by angels, it was that serious. Listen to this question, my friend. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, that great salvation that God sent His own Son to deliver, to tell us about, and He gave His life for? How are we going to escape if the people who, when they received the law by the hand of angels, uh, didn't escape? How can we escape? Friend, there's several important things to realize here. Number one, don't miss this. How great it is that we live in the day and age where salvation is not a prophecy, not a promise, not something we're looking for but a reality. Today, men and women can obey the gospel, become Christians, have every sin washed away, and take part in the fulfillment 
of God's plan. How will we escape if we neglect that? It's a rhetorical question. We're not going to escape. There won't be anything else to come. This is the fulfillment of God's plan. And so the Hebrew writer illustrates so beautifully in chapter 2 how wonderful it is to be a Christian. Then in chapter 3, he begins to bring down in their mind some of these people that they're probably holding up, maybe even higher than Christ. Christ is now mentioned as being greater than Moses. Moses was a great man of God, and the writer will here go on to say that. But we have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who is much greater. Moses was a great servant in the house of God. Christ, as a son over his house, the Hebrew writer will say, whose house you are if you continue faithful to the end. Yes, Moses was a good servant of God. Uh, took the Ten Commandments to the people. Uh, he opened the Red Sea. God opened the Red Sea. Moses and the people walked through on dry land. Moses led them up to the brink of the promised land. Great, great man of God. But when you contrast Moses and Christ, is there any comparison? Well, here's the comparison the Holy Spirit gives. Moses, what was he? He was a son or a servant in God's house. Hey, he was a great one, no doubt about it. Is Christ greater? He's way up here. Christ isn't a servant in God's house. Christ is son over his house. He is the son of God. He is the one who has that power. He is God. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 8 and 9, if you'll study that context carefully, God says to Christ, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God, the Father, calls the Son. God. Jesus isn't a servant in the house. He is a son. He's the son of God. He is deity and thus he is the one who has that power. That's why he's greater than Moses. And then in chapter 4, the Hebrew writer will now step next in line to Moses with Joshua. When you put people in the Hebrew mind that were really important, did really great things, no doubt you've got at the top Moses, deliverer of God's people. And then under him, Joshua. What did Joshua do? Joshua actually took God's people and led them across the Jordan River, through the Jordan, into that wonderful promised land. And all of this is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 4. And yet the writer will say, Jesus is greater than Joshua in that he's not delivering us into, leading us into a physical promised land of rest. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God that's greater than what they received. You remember that land? that Joshua led them to, the Canaan land, the land flowing with milk and honey, how wonderful that was for the people. And yet they still had to drive out the enemies. There were still problems and thorns in their flesh that would arise. Sin still would crop up. Here's what the writer will say in Hebrews 4 verse 9. There remains therefore today, in the, in, as he's writing to Christians, he says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Christ is greater than Joshua because he's not leading us to a physical land promise rest. He's leading us to the heavenly rest. Jesus said this, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus promised his people in my father's house are many mansions. Were it not so, I would have told you. Jesus is leading us toward that heavenly rest. How much greater that is than Joshua and the physical rest there. Then in chapter 5 of the book of Hebrews, as we follow this theme down, we now have mention of Aaron. And Aaron, Moses' brother, was a great man of God. But in chapter 5, we're going to learn that Christ is greater than Aaron and by default, greater than the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. And so in chapter 5, he begins to talk about Aaron, Christ being greater than Aaron, his priesthood being better. He, me, he brings up the name Melchizedek. But as he does, he begins to realize some of these people are not ready to receive it. 
And so in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 following, we've got one of the strongest rebukes in the Bible where the Hebrew writer says, I wanted to feed you with meat, but you are not ready for it. You still need the milk of the Word. And so he takes a moment in the midst of this discussion to encourage them to go on to maturity and perfection, which is what Hebrews chapter 6 is all about. Them growing and going on to perfection and not staying stagnant. Then in chapter 7, the Hebrew writer is going to pick up with this argument, Christ is greater than Aaron, and by default, Christ is greater than the Levites. Uh, this is such an important argument, and he's going to use Melchizedek as the priesthood of Christ. We go back to Genesis 15, and Melchizedek was king of Salem, priest of God there. It is told to us, and yet he wasn't of that Levitical lineage. No father, mother's parents were not Levites. Uh, he didn't have a set time he could begin, set time he could end. His days did not end is the idea, and so Christ is greater than the Levitical priesthood and Aaron because he's of the priesthood of Melchizedek. That is, divinely appointed by God. And he remains a priest. He is uh, in that state as well. And so what a wonderful picture there of the uh, priesthood of Christ and how that Christ is greater than that Levitical system. And friend, chapter 7 kind of brings this to a climax when he talks about the Levites because if Christ is a priest of a different order, and the, he's greater than the Levites, then that whole system is no more. Why would you want to go back? Here's what he's saying. Why would you want to go back to a, a system that is inferior? Why would you want to go back to a system that could never really take away sin? A system that didn't have a complete answer for the sin problem, when there is a sacrifice and there is a priest who can completely remove it. Hebrews 7 verse 25 and 26 clearly tells us why Christ is greater. Listen to these words. Hebrews 7 verse 25 and 26. Therefore He, Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him since He ever lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests offer up sacrifices. Listen first for his own sins, then for his people. This he did once for all when he offered up himself. Why would you go back to a, a system that can't fix the problem, the remedy? Why would you go back to that which is no more when you've got something so much greater? And so that's what he's trying to help these people to see. Chapter 8, he'll talk about the greater covenant. It's a greater covenant built on greater promises and it's what was prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. And so the covenant is greater. There is a greater tabernacle, that being the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately there is a greater sacrifice. Friend, don't you know this had to resonate with every Hebrew who had made a sin sacrifice. I want you to think about what happened under uh, the book of Leviticus. Let's say I'm, I'm a Jew, I'm a Hebrew, I'm living under the Ten Commandment Law, and according to the book of Leviticus, when I sin, I've got to go out to the field, I've got to get a heifer, uh, I've got to take it, uh, or a lamb, or uh, I've got to take it to the priest. It's got to be slaughter, slaughtered, its blood has to be drained, it has to be cooked on the altar, and, and all of that for my sin. And then still, Hebrews 10 verse 3 and 4 says, it could never really take away sin. You've done that in your life. You know what, how bloody, how gruesome of event that is. You realize uh, the penalty of sin. And then to hear the words of Hebrews chapter 10, that it could never really take away sin. There is a greater sacrifice. Listen to these words. Hebrews 10, I want you to listen to verses 3 and 4 and then verse 12. But in those sacrifices, Old Testament sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Now contrast that with Hebrews 10 verse 12. But this man, Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Friend, why would you ever want to go back to a system 
of bloody sacrifices that could never really take away sin when you've got Christ who offered one sacrifice for sin forever and it completely removes that? This is the argument. He's helping these uh, Christians who've got a Hebrew background understand, don't go back to a system that isn't anymore, to the inferior, to that which is not able to immediately fix the problem when you've got the remedy and the answer right here. And thus, Hebrews chapter 11, he will encourage them, just like all the faithful of old, don't give up, overcome by faith. Continue to put your trust in God. Think about Abraham. Think about Noah. Think about Moses. Think about Joshua. Think about all these people who in, in challenging situations continue to trust God and how God helped them and they eventually overcame through that. Then in Hebrews chapter 12, he tells us to focus on the greater things. Seeing then that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all these faithful of old, let us continue to run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. Basically, He says to these Christians, don't take your eyes off of Christ. Keep looking to Jesus. Keep your gaze and your focus where it needs to be. Don't listen to all the talk around you. Don't let all the challenges get you down. Stay focused on Christ. Continue to run the Christian race. And remember, our faithfulness to God must be that which helps us. Hebrews 13, he will encourage them, let your faithfulness be greater. You and continue to follow and do the things that God wants you to do. And so we hope today, as we've thought about the book of Hebrews, as we've introduced this wonderful study, that it will encourage us, don't go back. Whether it be the world whether it be sin, whether it be denominationalism, whatever we've come out of to become a Christian. Oh, there are days where it may feel like it'd be more comfortable to go back to that. No, you're living the superior life right now. Christ is greater than whatever you left behind, no matter the challenge or the difficulty, for in heaven will be worth it all. If you're not a child of God, we encourage you to become one. If you'd like to study more about that, please don't hesitate to write us or call us. We'll be happy to help you with that. And we hope that every one of us will be motivated to keep pressing toward the prize and that you'll join us next time as we study more from the book of Hebrews. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.